So friends, remember when Donald Trump said he wants to be a day one dictator? Well, come Monday, it looks like he's going to be a day one defendant. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So are y'all ready for Monday? The first criminal trial of Donald Trump is set to begin in a Manhattan courtroom with jury selection on Monday, April 15th. Let's start with some of the new reporting that gives us something of an overview of what to expect. And then I wanna spend some time talking about what goes into pre-trial preparation of any criminal case, but especially a big, high-profile criminal prosecution. But let's start with the new reporting. This from NBC News. Headline, Trump's hush money trial begins Monday. Here's what to expect. And that article begins, Donald Trump will become the first former president to stand trial in a criminal case next week, and he'll do so against the backdrop of a presidential campaign in which he's the presumptive Republican nominee. Jury selection begins Monday in New York City, and the trial is expected to last six to eight weeks. Here's a look at what you need to know and what's expected to happen. How long is jury selection expected to last? Jury selection is expected to last one to two weeks. A criminal trial involving Trump's company before the same judge in 2022 took a week to select 12 jurors and five alternates. What is Trump charged with? Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg charged Trump with 34 counts of first-degree falsifying business records, a low-level felony. What's the prosecution alleging? Prosecutors allege Trump repeatedly and fraudulently falsified New York business records to conceal criminal conduct that hid damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. At the heart of the case are allegations of various sex scandals that prosecutors say Trump tried to suppress with the help of his lawyer, Michael Cohen, and top executives in charge of the National Enquirer. In the final days of the election, Cohen paid $130,000 to one woman, adult film star Stormy Daniels, to keep silent about her claim she'd had a sexual encounter with Trump in 2006. Trump has denied the allegation. After he was elected, Trump reimbursed Cohen through a series of checks from his trust that were processed through the Trump Organization and labeled as payments for legal services rendered, a claim the DA says was false. What is Trump's defense? Trump has maintained he didn't do anything wrong. And while he has acknowledged reimbursing Cohen, he said he didn't know the details about what Cohen was doing. Who will testify for the prosecution? Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, Karen McDougal, a former Playboy model who said she had an affair with Trump, a claim he denies, David Pecker, a Trump ally who was the CEO of Inquirer publisher AMI at the time, Dylan Howard, another former AMI executive, former White House communications director Hope Hicks, former Trump assistant Madeline Westerhout, and others. Will Trump have to be in court every day? Unlike the New York civil fraud and E. Jean Carroll defamation trials, the DA's case is criminal. So Trump is required to be in court every day to participate in his defense. So friends, what goes into preparing to prosecute a big case? What does pretrial preparation look like? Well, here are some of the highlights based on my experience. First of all, preparation is key. Preparation is king. 
you know, preparing a case well does not guarantee success, but failing to prepare a case well pretty much guarantees failure. So pretrial preparation is the key to success. What does some of that preparation look like? First of all, by the time we are on the eve of trial, as we are now in Donald Trump's first criminal prosecution, I will have met with the, the witnesses many times over. And in the run-up to trial, I will have taken them through a dry run of the direct examination. The exact questions I will ask them once they're on the witness stand in court. I don't want there to be any surprises. I will not only ask them every question I intend to ask them in court, I will show them every exhibit that I'll ask them to identify during their testimony, every photograph, every document, every text message, every email, every contract, every phone record, everything. So they are comfortable, they're at ease, and there are no surprises. I will then conduct a mock cross-examination with the witness. I will try to come up with every possible question, every area of cross-examination that the defense attorney might hit them with to try to give them a sense of what's coming. Now, I will give the witnesses lots of standard advice. For example, first and foremost, this is the most important rule. This is the one non-negotiable I had as a prosecutor and many other prosecutors have. Um, I tell the witnesses, tell the truth, the full truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, warts and all. If there's some evidence that you think hurts the prosecution, hurts our chances at winning a conviction, you make sure you testify about it fully, accurately, and truthfully. You tell the truth about the stuff that's good for the prosecution, you tell the truth about the stuff that's bad for the prosecution. The truth will set you free, and we demand nothing less. I then try to give them advice like, when you're being cross-examined by the defense attorney, that person might come across as less than friendly, less than cordial, less than polite, less than civil. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But don't rise to the bait, because often defense attorneys will try to get you angry, will try to confuse you, will try to get you off your game, try to get you to agree to things that aren't necessarily truthful or accurate. Just approach cross-examination, approach you know the answers that you give the defense attorney with the same demeanor, the same tone, the same respect as you give the prosecutors when you're answering our questions. And I make sure to tell the witnesses that if the truthful answer to any question is, I don't know, then please say, I don't know. That's a perfectly acceptable answer if it's the truth. Don't try to fill in gaps. Don't try to force memories you don't have. If the answer to a question, the truthful answer is, I don't recall, then that is the answer you give. Now, mind you, if you get asked the question by a defense attorney along the lines of, well, you remember going into the grand jury and on page 84, you know, line 17, didn't you tell the grand jury X, Y, and Z? You can certainly say, you know, sir, ma'am, I, I don't completely recall what I said about that in the grand jury, but if you can show me my grand jury testimony, my transcript, that would probably help refresh my memory. That is a perfectly acceptable answer to give on cross-examination. Indeed, it's an acceptable answer to give on direct examination when the prosecutor is asking you the question, if you know there's something in your grand jury transcript, but you just can't quite fully recall it right now. So, you know, all of this is really an exercise in telling the truth, in thinking about the question, if a question is confusing, either from the prosecutor or the defense, a perfectly acceptable answer is, you know, can you please rephrase that? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. And as long as you tell the truth, then everything will work out. And then obviously another part of pretrial preparation, by the time we are, you know, on the eve of trial, 
I will have drafted and redrafted and fine-tuned and run by my friends and colleagues my opening statement to make sure it is as compelling, concise, and convincing as I can possibly make it. And I'll talk more as the trial progresses about opening statements, direct examination of witnesses, cross-examination of witnesses, closing arguments, rebuttal arguments. We'll talk about jury deliberations. And friends, come Monday, we're going to talk a little bit about jury selection, right? What is it that prosecutors and defense attorneys look for in the perfect juror or in an acceptable juror? And believe me, it varies depending on the case. Um, and if you ask 100 experienced trial court prosecutors and 100 experienced criminal defense attorneys, you're going to get 100 different answers. There will be some similarities. But I have heard people say things like, I never want a lawyer on my jury. I've had people say, I always want a lawyer on my jury. I am more in the latter camp, and I'll talk to you about why that is based on my experience. Uh, some people will say, because a lawyer will second guess all of my, my legal decisions, my strategy, my tactical decisions. They'll be grading my arguments. They'll be assessing whether my objections are right or wrong. And some people say, well, lawyers kind of understand the process, and they know how to apply the rule of law to the facts, and they know how to you know, weigh evidence and reach supportable credibility determinations. So some people love lawyers on their juries. Some people hate lawyers on their juries. Some people will say, I never want a member of the clergy on my jury. They're too forgiving. Some people will say, I always want a member of the clergy on my jury because they're eye for an eye kind of people. And believe me, trial litigators, criminal practitioners, We'll have opinions about social workers and bus drivers, doctors and scientists, politicians and school teachers, and on and on and on. So I want to dig into the nuts and bolts of jury selection as I selected well over 100 juries in my time as a, a career prosecutor, and it's, it's a lot of fun to talk about. I'll do that probably on Monday as jury selection begins in uh, Donald Trump's criminal trial up in New York. And then as the case moves toward opening statements, I'm really excited to talk with you all about what goes into an opening statement, particularly for a prosecutor. That is my frame of reference. That's my comfort level. Mind you, defense attorneys are not required to give opening statements. Remember, defendants never have a burden of proof at trial. The burden of proof never shifts to the defendant it always remains with the prosecution. The defendant is presumed innocent unless and until the prosecution presents enough evidence to convince a juror of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant never has to prove anything. The defendant has to, doesn't have to give an opening statement, doesn't have to call a single witness, doesn't have to present a single item of evidence, doesn't even need to cross-examine the prosecution's witnesses. They can rest on the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And I've had defense attorneys do that, present nothing. And then at the end of the case, what they argue is, ladies and gentlemen, you weren't even surprised, were you, when I didn't present a single shred of evidence, when I didn't call a single witness, and you already in your heart know why I didn't put on any evidence, because I didn't have to, because the prosecution failed miserably in its you know, feeble attempt to prove my client guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The evidence fell woefully short, so I didn't need to present witnesses. I didn't need to introduce evidence. I barely need to make an argument. All I need to do is ask you all respectfully to go back into the deliberation room and do the right thing based on not the evidence, but the lack of evidence that the prosecution presented to you find my client not guilty it can be a compelling argument. It's often an argument made when the government's evidence is really strong and the defense has no compelling evidence to offer to rebut it. So then you go with, you know, lots of bluff and bluster. You know, there is the old saying that many of you have probably heard. 
If you've got the facts on your side, pound on the facts. If you've got the law on your side, pound on the law. If you've got neither on your side, just pound on the table. And I have heard my fair share of table pounding in criminal trials that I prosecuted over the years. But let me circle back to opening statements for just a minute. And we're going to talk more about what goes into preparing an opening statement as jury selection winds down. We've got 12 jurors and a series of alternate jurors in the box. And we know that opening statements are about to commence. Um, there are some things about opening statements that are counterintuitive. For example, you want to start strong. You want to start with some of your best, strongest, most compelling evidence when you begin your opening statement to the jury. But the other thing that you need to do, and this may be counterintuitive to folks who don't try criminal cases, is you have to talk about the weaknesses in your case. You have to front the weaknesses to the jury. We call it drawing the sting because the last thing you want to do is hide evidence that you know will be introduced during the course of the trial, in part because you will introduce it, um, and let the defense be the first one to spring it on the jury. Like the fact that Michael Cohen has lied several times previously. Michael Cohen's going to be a prosecution witness, so the prosecution needs to front load all of that information and talk about it during opening statements. Because when you talk about it, you frame it. You suggest to the jury what it means, how important it is, and, it, and most importantly, you then begin to talk about all of the corroboration, all of the supporting and affirming evidence, the, the audio recording of Donald Trump and Michael Cohen talking about, you know, doing this dirty hush money payment. Um, you talk about the, the documents that were signed. You talk about Donald Trump writing the reimbursement checks. You front Michael Cohen's credibility problems, but you frame them for the jury and you say, notwithstanding his earlier lies, some of which were told to, to help Donald Trump stay out of hot water. You take that weakness and you turn it to a strength. He was just being loyal to his criminal associate, right? Somebody who is higher up on the criminal food chain than he is, Donald Trump. Um, but you have every reason to credit him, even if he told those lies in the past. But you have to front the bad stuff, the weaknesses, and you have to draw the sting from it by then building it back up during opening statements with the corroboration. I'm going to stop there because I could go on forever. And as you can probably tell, I really miss trying criminal cases. And friends, let me finish with a word of caution. Every criminal trial has ups and downs. One day it will look like things are going really well for the prosecution, for the people of New York, for the people of the United States, when it comes to holding Donald Trump accountable for some of his crimes. And then other days, the reports coming out of the courtroom will shake your confidence in maybe the quality or quantity of the evidence, and you'll begin to uh, be concerned, um, fearful even, that maybe Donald Trump is not going to be held accountable. There will be ups and downs. It will be, you know, hopefully two steps up and one step back. So I would say buckle up. It is going to be uh, a bumpy and perhaps anxiety producing six to eight weeks, this trial. But based on my assessment of the quality and quantity of the evidence and what I am absolutely confident of is we probably only know a fraction of the incriminating evidence and information that Alvin Bragg amassed during the course of his investigation, I still have a good feeling about how this trial will play out. I think it will result in guilty verdicts and accountability coming to Donald Trump, finally, for just some of his crimes against the people of New York and by extension against we the people. Because justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.